Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you today to our festival of Christian pilgrimage. Many of you will know that 2020 has been declared a year of pilgrimage. Of course, a lot of those plans have to be modified um, because of the situation. And certainly when we were planning this event at the end of last year, this is not exactly what we had in mind, but we are absolutely delighted that we're able to have an online festival today. And thank you to our speakers who are really fantastic and we're so grateful they're joining us. I'm gonna hand you over now to my colleague, Sally. Hello, I'm Sally Welsh, one of the other, the other organiser of this event. Um, I hope you're deeply impressed with the background. My background is full of books. I would like to say that it's my study, it's not. We're in the Dean's study, socially distanced, of course, because this is the Dean's study and there is plenty of room in here, but we will be um, hosting the questions and things like that from here. Just to give you an idea of how the day will happen, the talks are pre-recorded, so we'll listen, everybody will listen to the talks first, and you will be able to comment um, using the comment facility. If you put, I've got a question, then I will be able to see the questions and we will be going after the recorded talk, going over to have a live discussion with each speaker after their talk. So if you have any questions for the speaker, write them down and then um, I will gather them up and make some kind of, I hope, intelligent and pertinent question to the speaker. I think that's just about it. I'll just consult with my, anything else? No, we're good to go. We're gonna begin with our first speaker, which is the Dean of Christchurch himself, Martin Percy. A very warm welcome to you today to Christchurch Cathedral on behalf of myself as Dean and the chapter, and indeed all of us here at Christchurch to this inaugural festival of pilgrimage. Let me say right at the very beginning how glad we are that you are able to join us in this way. And although it's not, of course, what we originally intended, I'm particularly pleased that the organisation done by Sarah Merrick and all of our colleagues has meant that we've been able to welcome a great many more people online to this festival of pilgrimage. So thank you for being here and I hope that the lectures and talks and conversations that will now proceed will be ones that you will find stimulating and refreshing wherever they find you. And please, at this time, be assured of our thoughts and prayers, wherever you are viewing from and wherever this finds you. So I've been asked to talk about pilgrimage in um, a pretty general kind of way this morning. And I suppose I want to begin by just reflecting on what a friend and colleague of mine remarked very recently on their first, and I have to say, I suspect, last visit to the shrine of Lourdes in France. It felt to him like religion had met with Weatherspoons and Poundland. As he remarked, there was simply too much tat on display to buy, and more religious kitsch than you could shake a stick at. You couldn't get a decent coffee or meal for love nor money. And he said it reminded him of a, a fading English seaside resort long past its sell-by date, in the middle of an economic crisis. The only difference in Lourdes being there was no sea to gaze at. I did ask whether there were any one-armed bandits there, and he said no, there were no amusement arcades, but uh, it was pretty close. Pilgrimages are as old as the hills, quite literally. It's pretty likely that Stonehenge was a site of pilgrimage. Maybe the pyramids were too. We know that Jesus, Mary and Joseph went on pilgrimage to visit the temple. Chaucer wrote about pilgrimages. There are Muslim pilgrimages, Buddhist, Catholic, Protestant, pre-Christian, Christian, post-Christian, post New Age, Old Age, think saga holidays, pilgrimages that combine eco-tours, politicised trips to the Holy Land, and walking holidays to Santiago de Compostela for those who are really hardy and fit. Our medieval forebears shaped pilgrimages around the natural environment and the resources that they encountered, as well as celebrating 
potent reminders of the heroic individuals who had first planted faith in England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland. Medieval folk regarded the sites of pilgrimage as a kind of matrix point of access to the divine. They were a network of places where supernatural power was regularly made manifest to human beings. One writer says they were like sacralized places of holy radioactivity, if you can imagine that, with the power of the spirit emanating from the fragments of the bodies of martyrs and saints, or by second, secondary relics of their activity and presence. And these sites stimulated a tradition of ritual journey, which was a defining feature of contemporary religious experience. Many people went on pilgrimage for reassurance and for solace. They went away for all kinds of things to do with healing and atonement. Some were just curious. And I dare say, if you follow Chaucer literally, some were along for just the ride and a rather good time. What the journey did do, however, was provide what one sociologist calls a therapy of distance. The pilgrimage was the external expression of an internal search for transcend transcendental meaning, a kind of extroverted mysticism, as well as a break from the normal routines and humdrum of ordinary social life, which was provided with convening excuses for social frivol uh, frivolity, a kind of spiritual tourism, colored a bit more by secular motives. And of course they drew individuals from all kinds of different backgrounds, enabling people to foster what some anthropologists have called communitas, the binding together of a group of people who probably didn't know each other that well beforehand, but by the end were firm friends and bound in fellowship. When we look back at local sites of pilgrimage to the city and county of Oxford, you can find some pretty strange growings on, which show that pilgrimages were popular long before the Reformation and long after it. Crowds flocked to see the wonder-working springs at Binsey, dedicated to St. Friedwide, and they came to this cathedral to be near her mortal remains, which were held to have healing properties. This all produced a thriving industry then in tat and souvenirs, so pilgrims returning home had something to show for their journey. But even long ago, not everybody was happy about this. St. Hugh of Lincoln in the 12th century attempted to suppress offerings at streams and rivers in Wickham, now High Wickham. He also complained about people who were spurred on by certain superstitious fantasies and what he called vain fabrications, who unlawfully venerated the utterly profane places as though they were sacred, and as he said, pretended miracles of healing had happened there. He banned in this diocese a spring situated in a field near Linslade in Buckinghamshire, where many people of inconstant faith, he called them, went out of a sense of false devotion. In 1304, Hugh of Lincoln turned his attention to the parish of St. Clement in Oxford, at which people at the time were revering St. Edmund with such excessive enthusiasm and in a highly unorthodox fashion that Hugh thought this was contrary to the faith of the church and the doctrine of the apostles. Further afield in 1351, Bishop John Grandison of Exeter went to war on a Marian chapel in the woods near Frivelstock in North Devon. He described that shrine as more fit for the proud and disobedient Eve or lewd Diana than the mother of God, demanding that the shrine be dismantled. He didn't mean that people were literally worshipping a false Greek goddess. Rather, he was getting extremely upset about forms of divination and fortune-telling 
that were performed there with particular enthusiasm and reference to the extreme lavishness of the cults suggested that people were engaging in practices linked with discovering the secrets of love and marriage by occult means. Or maybe it was just a kind of theological version of match.com. In post-Reformation Norwich, the bishop complained about the continuation of pilgrimages and celebrations around a relic of St. George. The procession had been, of course, suppressed since the Reformation. Unfortunately, this left behind in Norwich in 1550 high, 1559 a very large pantomime dragon in the city who was known as Snap. So the citizens of Norwich marched in gowns to indicate that they were the still protectors of its citizens rather than being linked to a dead medieval crusader. In Chester Cathedral, a more pragmatic route was taken in 1609. They'd also abolished their St. George's Day procession on April the 23rd, but they had replaced it with a re regular annual horse race, which they dedicated to the Prince of Wales, which they thought would be safer. That just meant the Red Dragon was back with lots of flags and red crosses and processions and pilgrimages, and this time horses. Meanwhile, back in Oxford, the waters of St. Cross also led to the naming of the parish of Holywell. In 1610, John King, who was both the Vice Chancellor of the University of Oxford and also the Dean of Oxford at the same time, was prevailed upon to get rid of the, seven, uh, the severed quarters of one George Knapper. He'd been hung in 1610 as a martyr, and legend had it that he pointed towards some healing springs or waters near the site of his death which were alleged to have healing properties for those who bathed their eyes in it or drank of it. This then prompted the then Dean of Christchurch, John King, to fill in the well and get hold of the last relic of Napa, um, an arm and a hand, and throw it into the Thames. However, legend had it that Napa's arm simply rose from the surface of the Thames and pointed once again directly to the spring, of course with a barely re veiled reference to the nativity and the wise men, locals were assured that if you were unsure of the direction, there would be a bright shining star above the spring, which the poor Dean of Christchurch had of course by then filled in. Every time an attempt was made to fill it in, it was dug up by the locals and the spring sprang to life. More seriously, the Bartlemas Chapel in Cowley, something for our time, was dedicated to lepers, people who had caught diseases, who'd returned from the Crusades and also from pilgrimages, having contracted leprosy. Pilgrimages then to the Bartlemas Chapel involved flowers, greenery, offerings of food, and of course, gifts for those who were incarcerated within it. Particularly every Holy Thursday, we find people on pilgrimage processing to the Bartlemas Chapel to give gifts to those who were behind it. In 1630, we find one Lady Forster deciding to bestow 40 shillings to restore the decaying well in St Edmund in Oxford. Two fellows decided to rebuild the well ornamentally in stone after it had been damaged during the English Civil War. These were resources for the poor, for those who couldn't feed themselves or support themselves after national trauma. Pilgrimages, in other words, had a point as well. Sometimes it was all about banding together walking together in order to do some common good. Carfax in Oxford had a holy well that attracted pilgrimages for many years. And even after the Reformation and in 1617, another benefactor by the name of Otto Nicholson 
also from Christchurch, erected an incredibly ornate structure over the cisterns bearing the arms of the city and the university and the allegorical figures of justice, temperance, fortitude and wisdom. So far, so good. But you may feel things went a little bit too far when he added eight other statues of what he thought were the worthies of his time. They were, in no particular order, King David, Alexander the Great, somebody called Edward of Bouillon, Ardaticus, Charlemagne, Hector of Troy for some reason, Julius Caesar, and then rather oddly, James I, whose inclusion was almost certainly just a vanity project. On the other hand, the destruction of a grove next to the Bartlemus Hospital in Oxford Cowley which was attracting many pilgrims, was actually shut down by the fellows of Oriel College. Although, as one historian notes, this was probably driven more by plans for a housing development than by anything anti-religious or anti-popish sentiments. So then, as now, we find fellows of Oxford Colleges doing strange things with planning development against local popular sentiment. Protestants went on pilgrimage too. They went to the places that commemorated the executions of Latimer, of Ridley, of Cranmer, and we can find similar traditions within Methodism, where devout Methodists even now go on pilgrimage to look at the tombstone of John Wesley's father in Epworth in Lincolnshire, or for that matter, come here to Christchurch to stand near or actually in the pulpit where John and Charles Wesley both preached, or stand on the spot where they were both ordained. In the Gospel according to Luke, Jesus embarks on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem when he's reached the age of 12. He's taken there by his mother and his father, and Luke tells us that he was lost for three days, but eventually recovered by his parents, who found him sitting with the wise men and confounding them with his wisdom. At the end of the Gospels, some women discover that after an absence of three days, they've gone to commemorate the body of Jesus. His body is again lost or stolen. His grave, which is already assuming the kind of quality or mantle of a shrine, is empty. And the gospel writers all quite differently describe the resurrection and once more the actual recovery of Jesus's body, his living body, leads to a deeper revelation. Jesus was lost but now is found and found in a new more wonderful form. Outside the tomb in the garden, Jesus says to Mary Magdalene, do not touch me. Don't come too close. Although you're here at this sacred place, we can meet and see. The followers and family of Jesus were blind, but now they see. There is that extraordinary sense that we find in the Gospels, the amazing sense in which Jesus is discovered on the road to Emmaus, discovered on journeys, discovered by people who journey to him, and discovered by people who accompany him on journeys, or when he journeys to them. We all know that extraordinary familiar hymn based on John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. There's no discouragement shall make him once relent. His first avowed intent to be a pilgrim. The Canadian philosopher Michael de Certin says that Christianity is founded on the loss of something, a body. By loss he means absence, but also presence, because the loss means there's no grave to go to for Jesus anymore, but there are shrines and memories of the presence of Christ being poured through 
the bodies and the bones of saints and sacred spaces and shrines, which are the touching place between heaven and earth. The function of a pilgrimage is transformation. It's about sacrifice, setting aside things, and walking and talking and fellowship, knowing that in the journey we gain. Christianity, as I used to say to ordinance, is a marathon, not a sprint. It's not quick. It's about the long journey. It's about realizing that the constancy and presence of Christ and the power of the Spirit walk with us through the valley of the shadow, in life, in death, in love, in loss, in celebration, in praise, in desolation. Christian life is the pilgrimage, and going on a pilgrimage helps us to realize that in particular ways, in particular kinds of journeying, Jesus meets us and encounters us afresh, and we encounter him in new ways. That's what the story on the road to Emmaus is all about. Disciples have gone to Jerusalem. It's only on the journey home, when they get home, that they realize they have been with Jesus all the time, and he's met with them in the breaking of the bread. So sometimes using a retreat can give us a particular way of experiencing a pilgrimage. Something like what we're doing now can give us insights into the way in which the Lord accompanies on the journey. Ignatian spirituality offers insights into interior reflections that offer the prospect of discovering the Christ who is within us. A pilgrimage to Lourdes or to Nock or to Medjugorje or Walsingham can be concerned with healing or penance. A pilgrimage with friends or group or on our own can somehow mean that the traveling there and the being there allows us to reconfigure ourselves. Even more recently, just the business of going to revival rallies or festivals such as Keswick, New Wine, Greenbelt, Spring Harvest. These are also forms of pilgrimage. Okay, there's no shrine or holy relics or aesthetic building at Greenbelt or New Wine, but there is gathering, there is a journey, and these are related. Mary Rubin suggests that of medieval Christians, pilgrimage was all about the creation of pre-political, undifferentiated human affinity, which dissolved the tensions and bound people together in space and time. Nicholas Lash, in one of his writings, talked about the difference between hollow spaces and holy places. But he added, even a hollow space is filled with a sense of God's manifest presence. If you've ever worshipped at Greenbelt or Spring Harvest, you'll know that even in a big tent, God's presence fills the space. So pilgrimages don't have to be about shrines, spaces or places. For many Protestants, God isn't in a place or in the midst of any particular shrine. It's in the praises of his people. Linking God to a place feels a bit constraining, even superstitious. But God is in mind, body and heart. Spiritual value often comes through God meeting us in places that we have least expected. Second, I think sometimes pilgrimage is not just about what we find, but also what we're prepared to lose. The journey itself is often an act of faith. Spiritual burdens or petitions are left behind there. They're brought, they're offered, but they are, as it were, 
given over to God. I sometimes say that pilgrimages are all about lost property, things that we've been carrying for a very long time that we're now ready to give up. And pilgrimage too is a mixture of imminence and transcendence. God is in us in a journey, but with us in fellow travellers, and with us in places or moments, in hospitality, in meals, in a shared drink in the pub afterwards. This intimacy matters. Pilgrims, attendees and worshippers all blend together by belonging together. At the moment, we live in incredibly challenging times. We live in what many regard as an age of anxiety. But I reminded that one of the phrases that Jesus uses repeatedly in the Gospels is, fear not, do not be afraid, it is I. Fear not. Jesus says it over 70 times in the Gospels. And sometimes the journey is simply an invitation to step out in faith. The pilgrimage is that simple word that Jesus utters to us all. Come. Come on this journey. Embark on this pilgrimage and see what good and grace and love and mercy I have to offer to all those who dare to take those first steps. In 1939, King George VI, on the eve of the Second World War, used a poem that was written by Manny Louise Haskins that she'd written in 1912 in a book called The Desert. Many will know these words. I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown and he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be to you better than light and safer than a known way. So I went forth and finding the hand of God and clutching it, trod safely into the night. Pilgrimages are journeys into the unknown. I cannot know what has brought you to this festival of pilgrimage, but God knows. Maybe your friends know. Maybe your friends, lovers, partners know too. However, I believe pilgrimage is timely. This place, this festival, Christchurch, is born out of journeying to seek God. Frideswide's shrine here is the birthplace of the cathedral, the college, the city and the university. It became a place of prayer, devotion, of healing, encounter and of pilgrimage. And pilgrimages like this bind us together. They bind us to the God who's journeyed to be with us from afar in Jesus Christ and in turn invites us to return to him. He came to dwell with us so we might dwell with him in eternity. Jesus comes to us on the road to Emmaus, walks with us in the pillar of cloud in the wilderness, finds us in the bush ablaze, and speaks to us in the still small voice while we cower in the cave. Cannot tell you where your pilgrimage will take you. I can only promise one thing. God will be with you every step you take. God is with us in these, our times, even when all may seem dark, hopeless and lonely and desolate, because he is the Lord of the journey. So, welcome to you all on this festival of pilgrimage. May the Lord walk with you and meet you as you journey. 
may you meet with Jesus as the disciples met with him in mystery on the road to Emmaus. May you know his presence, his love, and his tender grace as you begin and end your travels. God is with you. He is Emmanuel. God with us, journeying to us even before we have decided to set off. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Now, the next bit I thought was going to be challenging for me because I thought lots of you were going to write very many questions in the comments facility of your YouTube. And I, my problem was going to be picking out those questions and fielding them to Martin. However, it appears that you haven't asked any questions at all, but lots of people have been saying hello to each other, which is great. But if you've got any questions, they would be great too. However, I have, um, I have some questions. So in a way it's quite good because now I've got Martin all to myself. So Martin, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm, I'm gonna start by the thing that struck me most which was your comment on Lourdes, hang on, I'll just quote this, which you, to be fair, it wasn't you, you were repeating the comment of a colleague who said that it was like religion met with Weatherspoons and Poundland. And on what level would you agree with that? Have you been to Lourdes? I've passed through Lourdes, I mean, good morning. It's really good to see you. And, um, uh, very good to be here and I'm very glad we can do this pilgrimage festival together uh, like this uh, just delighted so thank you to everybody who's made this possible and uh, facilitated this um, so uh, long ago in a galaxy far far away before I was ordained and before I was an academic I uh, was a publisher and uh, I worked for a number of religious publishers and that meant that uh, from time to time uh, I got to see um, some uh, basically sort of uh, shrines um, throughout the UK and Ireland which uh, had bookshops and so I have a very vivid memory for example of going to Knock um, which is an island which uh, celebrates the uh, appearance or the apparition of uh, some visions of the Virgin Mary witnessed by some school children and uh, they now have the most enormous uh, sort of uh, cathedral dedicated to this as well, a huge car park and um, quite literally reservoirs, uh, I kid you not, of holy water. So the reservoir is blessed and then you can have the holy water on tap. And there's a, a very clear tap that states which is the holy water and which is the normal water. So you can fill that up at the tap. And then when you go into the bookshop uh, and the souvenir shop, it's it, it's full really of what can only be uh, kindly described as religious tat. Um, a lot of it's actually I think very interesting and some of it's incredibly moving but I've also discovered uh, similar tendencies I think at uh, Walsingham and on my one trip through Lourdes uh, I was uh, astonished actually to see all that was uh, available and that you could you know that basically you could buy I have to say, I think in fairness, um, when you look back at medieval pilgrimages, uh, they were also great places for souvenir hunters. And even now, uh, from the uh, banks of the Thames, when the uh, tide drains down, it's still possible sometimes to pick out coins of different value, which have been uh, clearly purchased from, uh, let's say, uh, some Friars Wise shrine here and they would have increased in value the closer you got to the shrine. So if you walk, let's say, from uh, Canterbury to Oxford, and uh, you decided that you'd uh, call it a day one mile outside Oxford and just spend your time in a local hostelry rather than uh, spending the premium amount of money it might have taken to get into the city, you could have bought a souvenir that effectively said in, in medieval English, you know, I've been to Fry to Eye Shrine, really. But the closer you get in, uh, the more valuable these coins are, really. But they were tat then, they're tat now. Do I um, 
sneer at that? No, actually, I don't. Um, I mean, quite genuinely, I think this is popular folk religion. It's for the people, it's of the people. It's uh, doing a really important spiritual job, actually. Um, you could sneer at this in a, a very classist way. I, I would really hope people would not, actually, because what it represents is uh, some bare token, and I choose my words with great care here, uh, a bare token like bread and wine, which reminds people that they've been to a place which has nourished them, sustained them, engaged them. And of course, it won't be to everybody's taste. Some of it sometimes can seem uh, comical to the point of being risible. But what it's doing spiritually deep down is reminding people of a place they've been, a prayer they've said, and something that's deeply and profoundly significant to them. And many people watching this will remember that um, when you actually are in church, you very often have uh, kneelers or hassocks to, uh, you know, basically place your knees on um, when intercessions are going on. And um, in the past, certainly when I've been preaching at churches celebrating one, two, five hundred years, I've often encouraged them to pick up the hassock or kneeler and give it a really good squeeze and hold it to themselves. Uh, and squeezing it, I think, reminds them that this is almost like a sponge. It's actually soaked in prayer that there have been decades, sometimes centuries of people kneeling on these things with their intentions, with their prayers, with their needs, their lives, the whole thing. And to hold those things to themselves. And I think religious souvenirs do a similar job. Um, they may seem like impulse purchases at the time. But people will look at them over the years and be reminded of a place they've been and a time that's been significant to them and where God has met them. So much better than Poundland and Weatherspoons, in my humble opinion. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm relieved to hear you say that, actually, because I, I think the place of objects and things and souvenirs is that can actually be very important and a way as you say of reminding people when they are no longer in the place of the feelings taking them back to that um the feeling that they had when they were in that place and the connection perhaps that they they had with god i have got more questions to ask but but now other people are asking questions too so i need to be a little bit unselfish um just just one, uh, somebody saying, that will the talks be available afterwards? And the answer to that is yes, they will be on our website, about which we will speak later. Um, I think we'll also be able to address the issue of, there's a question about relating pilgrimage to lockdown and isolation, which you, which you might want to reflect on, Martin. Um, one of the interesting things you said was that God might not be found in place but in praises which given the fact that we are an embodied people and we are bound by time and space I, do you just want to kind of tease out what you meant by saying and also my concern is that when then widening a definition of pilgrimage out so that it encompasses almost everything is there any way you can narrow down what you feel a definition, a useful definition of pilgrimage might be? Uh, something that's, uh, I think about pilgrimage, which is of, of, of and that I think sense of our spirituality being something that almost the only person who can really reflect on it is ourselves but we do it in company and in conversation it's also something that's interpretive it changes over time um, i'm very struck that one of the things that covid has uh, given to us i think um, and i don't say that this is necessarily a gift but um, it's certainly come to us is some sense of uh, isolation but contemplation and uh, being apart and having to get used to in a different way being comfortable in our own skin and uh, largely with our own thoughts 
conversations, I think, um, and the usual sort of social intercourse has just been much more difficult. I think there are consequences of this for the life of prayer. Of course, we miss gathering, we miss uh, uh, praising and praying together. And uh, what this time has done is, I think, pushed us back into ourselves, really, and remind us that actually we are in uh, quiet places, not necessarily desolate places, but, but quieter places. I think for spirituality, this has something to teach us about pilgrimage because it presses us into remembering that uh, Jesus himself took himself off into the margins and to the wilderness and to places where he could be quiet and recharge. Some of those times were forced upon him. Um, he didn't choose those particularly. They were just necessary for him to get out of all the uh, hullabaloo uh, that was going on and uh, the demands that were placed upon him. Uh, if you read the very early chapters of Mark's Gospel, you'll know that uh, after a particularly intense period of ministry, uh, very early on in Jesus' Galilean campaign, shall we say, um, he takes himself off um, either late at night or very early in the morning to be alone, to be still, to pray, to recharge. And the disciples, when they wake up, also quite early in the morning, um, realise that he's gone. And um, Mark says they went hunting for him. I mean, that's the word that's used, hunting. And when, of course, they find him, they say, we've looked for you everywhere. And Jesus' response is rather interesting. He says, hmm, should we go somewhere else? <laughs> so I think pilgrimage takes us off. It takes us out of life. It takes us into new places. But it takes us deeper inside to ourselves. It invites us to question what our journey is like, um, how the Lord accompanies us in that Christian journey, how we're being refined, changed, transformed, what are we leaving behind, what are we taking with us, um, what is God doing ahead of us in our future. Uh, fundamentally, uh, an inward journey, but a journey also that can be done in the company of others, but your journey is unique as much as mine is. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now getting more questions uh, coming through, some of which I'm going to answer really briefly myself because we're encountering them later on. So the question about applying pilgrimage to the local church context, I hope to be covering that in the last session of the day. So that's a really good incentive for you to hang on to the bitter end. Um, the bit about the history of pilgrimage and how far it goes back, Dee Dias will be covering, I hope, in, in her talk. Labyrinth's whole other festival, I've got to say. I'm very interested in labyrinths myself, but, but we're going to stick for the moment, I think, to kind of the mainstream bit about pilgrimage. So, Martin, could you say a bit more about your comment earlier? Spiritual value often comes from God meeting us in a place that we least expected. I think for many of us, we expect or hope uh, or imagine that, that God meets us in uh, goodness, kindness, gentleness, uh, peace, uh, so many things that are actually good in life. I think the striking thing about pilgrimage sometime is that we are bound to encounter God in uh, darkness and difficulty. It's not to say, of course, that God orchestrates, originates or sends the difficulty but it is simply to say that God will use anything, anyone, and everything, and everyone to speak through them and to us. Um, one of my favourite writers is um, an Indian Jesuit called uh, Louis Bermejo. Uh, and uh, he talks about how the Holy Spirit speaks to the church and changes the church. And he has uh, four C's for this um, you know, sort of alliteration, really. Uh, communication, conflict, uh, consensus, 
and then finally communion. Now most people uh, expect and understand that God communicates to us. Most people understand that God is interested in consensus and we all understand that God meets with us in communion. But how many of us really, hand on heart, are prepared to hear God speaking to us or at us in conflict? Conflict between people in our churches, between you and your, let's say, clergy or uh, laity, uh, in your families, in your close relationships. The words of truth come to us through them too. This is not a surprising thing when you think about how the Gospels work. Jesus is constantly telling his audiences that God will meet them through despised Samaritans, despised tax collectors, uh, through the lame, through the uh, cripples, through so many other different people, through the unclean, actually. So my plea here is for a, a wide, broad, spiritually and emotionally intelligent view of the goodness and imagination and vision of God to speak to us through things that we would genuinely and generally otherwise shun, maybe even loathe. So that's what I mean by by unexpected things that we would not naturally find active, but would find uh, possibly worse repellent, really. Again, if you think about this in the history of the church for the moment, to keep it a little bit abstract, we don't have creeds as the result of uh, a convivial afternoon with the PCC in which they sat down with a few ideas about who God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit was, put them up on a flip chart with some post-it notes and arrived at a satisfactory solution at the end of the afternoon. The creeds evolved over tense, difficult, highly acrimonious, even occasionally violent meetings, and that's how we got the creeds. We didn't get the New Testament any differently. People argued strongly and sometimes vociferously about what should be in and what should be out and what was important and what was not. I think what happens to us in pilgrimage is we sometimes discover not just new friendships, but we discover that frenemies, um, the enemies we thought we had, turn out to be agents of God's redeeming love. They turn out to be emissaries of God communicating to us. They turn out to be ways in which the Holy Spirit wants to teach the church. The lessons there in the Old Testament too. Uh, the only person to be called Messiah in the Old Testament is in Isaiah, Cyrus. Cyrus is not Jewish. Cyrus is a worshipper of pagan gods. But Cyrus is the emissary that Isaiah celebrates, who has actually brought redemption and freedom to God's chosen people. Now, if that's true in the Old Testament, and it's true in the New Testament, where is it with me and with you? Who speaks the word of truth to us in our pilgrimage, who we dislike, who we would rather not listen to? The church, I have to say, generally, more on the abstract here, is not very good at this. We are uh, usually quite clear about who our friends are, and we're usually quite clear about who to resist. But actually, God is not mocked by this. God loves to confound the wisdom of the wise with the foolish and broken and base things of the world. So what happens is that God often uses things to shame the church. So the unexpected places where God meets us will be through uh, people that we did not expect to be walking with, people who were not welcome to accompany us on the road to Emmaus, but nonetheless tag along, people who were there at the supper as the bread is broken, who we did not invite to that feast. And if it was left to us, we would not invite them. But God does invite them. God does bring them along and God will use them to refine us and teach us because in the end God wants us to be more like him which means broader hearts, broader minds, better eyes, open ears, receptive, 
being in the end like the body of Christ, becoming like him as we walk like Christ, because Christ wants us to become more like him. Thank you, Martin. And, and actually that resonates very strongly with some of the things I have learned while on pilgrimage when um, taking groups of pilgrims and secretly thinking as people sign up, gosh, I really hope that person doesn't sign up because I'm not sure I can bear to spend all day in their company. And then in a very humbling fashion, discovering so much more of them and the things that lie behind the way they speak and act as they do and and it being a real genuine lesson that that, that i have learned um and also when you talk about meeting god where you least expect it in the difficult things one of my um clearest memories is when we took the children when they were very small on pilgrimage and our youngest just sitting down in the middle of the road and going i can't go any further and us saying to him, um, you have to, because there is nothing else that you can do except just walk through this difficult bit and you will get to the end of your journey, but but only you can do that. Um, I've got some more questions. Hang on, we have, we're slightly running out of time. There's been some of the comments being made about your referring to pilgrimage memorabilia as TAD which I have taken just to be your shorthand for pilgrimage memorabilia. But um, I think there's some... Tat, are we allowed to call it Tat? I, um, I, um, I'll just say what, what I mean by Tat. I'm afraid 10 years um, uh, as a, a theological college principal taught me that um, the... Um, uh, appetite for religious tat was um, almost limitless really and it never ceased to amaze me what ordinands would bring back from various shrines and pilgrimages really um, I don't use the word tat in a dismissive way it's it's my uh, collective noun for uh, all things uh, peripheral <laughs> that are brought into the center and are uh, a wonderful reminder actually of uh, the joyousness and the humor of God actually I, I, I think some of them are just absolutely fabulous and I've heard some terrific uh, homilies and sermons on um, anything from um, mugs that change color when you put hot liquid in them uh, to have Jesus waving at you uh, with your steaming coffee and as you drain it uh, Jesus gradually calms down uh, right the way through to other things that you can pop in your car or on your fridge or something like that um, some of these things are actually, of course, intended to be funny. Some of them are not entirely meant to be taken seriously. Um, I don't think that should um, particularly surprise us. Uh, there's um, a number of things in Scripture exactly like that. Uh, let's not uh, forget that the Bible um, has humour, and the Bible also uh, contains things in it which we are actually intended uh, not to take entirely seriously because they're being either ironic or, or whatever else they may be doing here. Um, so um, I'm not a collector of religious tat, although I have to say a long, long time ago, um, I used to collect religious comics and tracts, and um, I still have some of those. And uh, I, I, I cherish them because actually, um, although they are now rather odd to look at, um, the important thing to remember about them is that they were attempts to communicate important religious truths through a medium that was incredibly popular at the time. Those mediums will change in 50 years and 100 years. But what we grasp now is the willingness and the risk of God to be present in everything, um, including the things that we find base or might amuse us. Thank you. Um, and you are not a collector of religious tact, as your study demonstrates, but you've got an awful lot of books, which may be serving the same purpose. Um, just before we go, we've got about two minutes. You've talked about pilgrimage as loss, pilgrimage as um, to be found not in place, but in praises, it being not about shrines or places or space. Can I push you? Just one last time, some kind of general definition of what, what pilgrimage might be for 
filled it with few rather than forcing you to make a, a something that would stand for everybody. Yeah. Oh, that's a really great question. Um, some pilgrimages are unintended. Um, we uh, begin a journey in one way, and it's only as that journey continues that we discover God was actually taking us somewhere else and to a different place. And we had no idea. So some people set off on these journeys, sometimes in company, without realizing that actually God has something else at the end of this for you. Emmaus, I think, is a particularly good example. Um, you know, those disciples have been in effect to what might have become a shrine, a tomb, and it's only on their return and when they're home that they discover the meaning of the incarnation, uh, that God is at home with us, Jesus is at home with them in the breaking of the bread. It ends where it started, God in the midst of us, in our homes. I think I'm very oh, struck by the fact that pilgrimages are um, beautifully disruptive of our spiritual lives. They are actually breaking the ground within us in a way that is good. Usually the force of physical movement complements our spiritual movement. Usually what then takes place is as the ground is broken, we see things afresh and new things uh, begin to take root and shoot up and grow. So for me, pilgrimage is acknowledging that the whole of our Christian life is a journey. It's a journey in which God was present at the beginning and during and right at the very end. But it is only by stepping out with God and being prepared to hold, as it were, that um, hand of Christ stepping into the future that we really encounter the light. Fundamentally, in the end, I suppose I would say pilgrimage is that deep reminder that God is never finished with us. Never. God never gives up loving us. God never gives up refining us. God never gives up trying to perfect us. But in all of that, we are comprehensively and universally loved. And so what else is there to do other than step forward and walk with Christ? Pilgrimage is, in the end, just that, taking us to the place of encounter where we will be transformed and changed, sending us home again, and reminding us that the journey is ongoing, that even when we've arrived at home, we are asked to refresh ourselves, but then rise up and walk to where God is leading us next. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, we've come to the end of this first session. We now have a break. We'll be back at 10.45 with the Arch, Archbishop of York, with the Archbishop of York, I am asked to remind you that the um, Church Times Bookshop is open. So go wild, and we'll see you in fifteen minutes. <laughs>